Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I hope you're all having um, a wonderful day. Uh, my name is John Roski. I'm a PhD student who has just received a, a doctorate in linguistics um, from Stony Brook University, where I was also part of the Institute for Advanced Computational Science. And starting in fall 2021, I'll continue to do linguistics as an assistant professor, um, but across the United States um, at San Jose State University. And today I'm going to discuss how typology emerges from computability. So, you know, today's lecture is about typology. Um, and as far as I understand typology, it regards the scope and limits of linguistic processes. Um, it's because this is the ACL SIG type lecture series, I'm going to be discussing computational typology. And for me, this means something very specific. It means understanding typology computationally, meaning computability. So the main lesson of this talk is that computability is an organizing principle for how we think and do typology. Okay, and so I'm going to lay out what that means. And I'm going to do so in the following way. So this lecture is going to be divided into four parts. Um, the first part, which you're in now, is going to discuss uh, the relationship between typology and computability. Second, um, we're going to situate various processes in natural language into the types of computation that we understand from this notion of computability. Okay, so we're going to match up uh, processes in natural language to types of computation. Finally, um, we're going to understand how you can use these types of computation combined with the typology of natural language processes to design and interpret neural interpretability experiments, particularly those related to sequence to sequence models in NLP. And finally, I'm going to conclude by discussing some open areas inside this research. But first, you know, I would be remiss if I claimed entire credit for this work. Very little of this work is actually mine. It is the result of tireless years of work by people listed on this screen who represent a gamut of researchers um, from Stony Brook, Rutgers, UC San uh, Diego, um, UMass Amherst, and many others, uh, some in France, University of Ottawa, um, and hopefully you'll be inspired enough by this that you'll want to join it as well. So I'm grateful to those who have taught me and worked with me on this, and I'm hopeful that you'll join our uh, adventure as well. Okay. Okay, so let's think about typology. Um, over the last several months, I've been very grateful to have stumbled upon this book, The Word in the World, which is India's contribution to the study of language. And from it, I've, I've learned that the study of typology has been very principled starting, you know, going all the way back to the ancient Sanskrit grammarians, um, particularly to a grammarian called Bhartari, who understood that doing typology requires you to have two databases, a, a way for you to organize the world and then a, a sort of collection of things that one wants to study in the world, particularly with relation to language. Now this mirror is almost exactly um, the way that Alexander von Humboldt, who you can see on the right here, conceived of doing typology, despite them being, you know, several millennia apart. Okay, so we have this line going all the way back to the Sanskrit grammarians and all the way through to Alexander von Humboldt and uh, honestly all the way through to modern linguistics of how to do typology. Von Humboldt gave these, these two databases names. He's called them an encyclopedia of categories and an encyclopedia of types. Okay, so these are the two encyclopedias that we have in linguistic typology. What are these two? So the encyclopedia of types is pretty familiar to all of us. It is the processes that exist in natural language. Okay, I chose those wording very carefully and we'll unpack them in just a second. Now, the encyclopedia of categories is the encyclopedia, the database that we use to organize and understand the encyclopedia of types. Okay. Now, the claim that I'm going to make in today's talk is that the encyclopedia of categories is a very richly described by the classes of computable functions. So the mathematical study of computable functions has a long and rich history, and it has a lot to offer to linguistic typology. Okay. Um, but before we can understand you know, the particular types, we have to make a distinction here. We have to make a principal distinction between linguistic data versus linguistic phenomena. And I'm going to go by some you know, work done by Bogan and Woodward back in the 80s, who 
make a very interesting distinction between what constitutes data and what constitutes phenomena. What are data? Well, data are unstable. You know, data are out there, right? They're perpetually accessible. They're what is observable to, to somebody who's going out in the world, but they're idiosyncratic to particular investigative contexts, right? Data for one person is not the same as data for another person. Data in one context is not the same data in another context. Data under one encoding is not the same data as in another encoding. Data for one purpose is not the same data as in another purpose. It's unstable, okay? A process, you know, that you're looking at in linguistics, you know, some pattern may exist one day, some pattern might be unreliably obtained the next day, right? So data is very, has to be very carefully drawn. In contrast, phenomena are relatively stable, okay? So data is unstable, but phenomena are stable, right? Uh, data is observable in, in particular context. Phenomena are recurrent. They are general features of the world, as uh, Bogan and Woodward say. Phenomena are also a varied ontological bag that includes objects, states, processes, events, and other features that are hard to classify. So in this talk, I'm going to be discussing linguistic phenomena. Okay? These are recurrent properties. These are processes that exist in natural language. They are derived from patterns that exist in particular languages and that are uh, you know, gathered through observation, through experiment. But they are not the object of our study. The object of our study are phenomena. Okay, so what do I mean by phenomena? Well, here, for the purposes of the, today's talk, because we only have an hour, um, today's talk is going to be illustrated by pieces of phonological and morphological typology. Okay, and in particular, I'm going to look at two classes of phenomena in uh, phonology and morphology, right? These are going to be our encyclopedia of types. Okay, so the possible linguistic processes that we have are going to come from these two areas, harmony and reduplication. Okay? If you're very curious about any of these two areas, because I'm only presenting sort of a survey, you're welcome to read these um, papers, which I've linked here. They're all accessible um, very easily, as far as I know. Uh, but you're welcome to ask me about them more as well. Okay? So let's look at possible linguistic processes. Right? Let's think about what is a possible process of harmony and what is a possible type of reduplication. What kinds of patterns could we have? Okay? Well, here are several. This is not an exhaustive list, right? This is just what would fit on a slide, okay? But it, it shows quite a range of possible types of linguistic processes inside these two categories, right? So for harmony, we might have what's called progressive harmony, right? This would say if we have vowels that look like E and U, right? Progressive harmony would say that they all become E's, right? right? So this is what the E would be the trigger, and then the U is sort of changed to match the E. Now, regressive harmony is sort of the same idea, but in reverse, right? So all the guys are supposed to agree on, you know, some feature here, but here, you know, this process, ooh, is going to be influenced by this E that comes at the end of the word, okay? So they're sort of the same process, but mirrored, right? We might also think of a type of harmony that's commonly called sour grapes harmony, which looks a lot like the progressive harmony, right? So something like this sort of E, um, vowel here is going to spread all along throughout the word, all these all these oohs are going to change into e, unless there's what's called, you know, a, a, the sour grape segment here, right? So this particular other vowel, ah, the presence of which is going to block the harmony, okay? So either something is going to spread or it's not going to happen at all, okay? So this is, comes from the, you know, the term sour grape spoils the bunch. We might also have circumambient harmony, where harm, you know, these oohs become e's only if there are e's on either side of them here, and this could be an unbounded distance apart, right? But where if, if that e doesn't exist, then it's just going to spit out the same identity function here. We might also think of a process, uh, well, we, we could call it majority rules harmony, where um, the oohs become e's if there are more e's than oohs, so here we have three e's in the input, and here we have, you know, two oohs, so they all become e's, right, because three is more than two. Um, but here, if we had a word like e, oo, oo, e, oo, where there are three oohs and two e's, then they would all become oohs, okay? So these are, you know, several different varieties of functions here, right? So notice these are maps from inputs to outputs. We're looking at coding these things as strings and then transforming a particular string into another string, okay? Another type of um, process that we can have is reduplication. We might have partial reduplication, which is a form of copying, 
All right. So, you know, various language patterns have something that's called, you know, natural language copying. This can take various types, right? What possible types could we have? We could have partial reduplication, where we copy a part of a word. So a word like ABCD, remember this is kind of a fake word, um, would turn into ABABCD, right? We copy just, you know, the first two segments here, maybe, All right? Um, total reduplication would copy the entire word. So ABCD would turn into a, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, right? Copy the whole thing. We might triplicate. We could copy the word three times, right? So A, B, C, D would become A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, right? Um, we could also have something that could look like polynomial copying, where uh, a word is copied as many times as the length of the input, right? So here the input is four segments long, so we could copy a word four times, okay? Right? If it was five segments long, we copy it five times. Here's a related version, but we could call it exponential copying, where a word like ABCD, every segment is copied as many times as its input uh, index, right? So, you know, the first segment is copied once, the second segment is copied twice, the third segment is copied three times, the fourth four times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, we could think of a really wacky type of uh, process like iterated prefix copying, where you copy um, a word as many times as the input length, but you copy all of its prefixes, okay? Right. So these are possible, right? Well, what, what does this tell us, right? Well, this tells us a little bit, but it doesn't tell us everything, right? So, um, you know, certain of these patterns seem weirder than others. The Sour Graves pattern seems quite weird. The majority of rules pattern is extremely weird when you think about it with respect to the world's languages. Polynomial copying seems odd. Exponential copying and iterated prefix copying all seem odd, and they're unattested, right? So, you know, polynomial copying, you're not going to find it anywhere in the world's languages. Exponential copying, as far as we know, doesn't exist. Iterated prefix copying, as far as we know, doesn't exist. All right? Majority rules harmony, as far as we know, uh, doesn't really exist. All right? So this is a type of a law. Right? There are things that exist, and there are things that don't exist. There are possible processes in the typology. There are impossible processes. So we have to characterize those. But we have to do this in a careful way. Because, you know, we have to think about the relationship between the data and the phenomena here, too, right? So, for example, total reduplication, you know, is a phenomena here. It's a function from input to output, all right? We might have individual processes like reduplication in Indonesian, just as we might have partial reduplication in Sundanese, all right? But the fact that we have partial reduplication and total reduplication, these are different statements than just collecting data, okay? So when we have a notion like bounded copying, that's bounded whether you have, you're copying just the first consonant, a consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, doesn't matter, okay, still bounded. In the same way, total reduplication is unbounded, all right? It doesn't matter what the underlying input length here is. It could be Juanita, it becomes Juanita, Juanita to make it plural. But it also could be 17 segments long. You'd have to copy those 17 segments twice, right? So they're unbounded, all right? Um, so a statement about reduplication is different than a statement about reduplication in Indonesian. Okay? So this brings us to a very crucial distinction I think is often misunderstood in linguistics, which is the notion of a phenomenological versus a theoretical law. A phenomenological law is a descriptively adequate statement, or an analytic or an approximate prediction within a framework, or extensions within a framework to handle new empirical cases. Most linguistic work is of this type. They are laws that describe, they are laws that approximate or analyze predictions, and they are laws that extend existing frameworks to handle new empirical data. In contrast, we can think of a theoretical law. A theoretical law is an explanatory statement about possible or impossible phenomenological laws. Okay? So um, Cartwright, 1983, says, you know, the distinction between theoretical has nothing to do with what is observable and what is unobservable. This is the point that linguists always get confused about. Instead, the terms here separate laws which are fundamental and explanatory from those that merely describe. Okay, so in this talk, we're going to be talking about computability as a theoretical law because we're making statements about phenomenological laws which govern the attested versus the unattested pattern in the world's languages. Okay. So what are our so that was a long way to say like our encyclopedia of types are the processes in natural languages, right? By which we mean the types of functions from inputs to outputs, um, and which we're going to for today's purposes encode as strings. 
what are the encyclopedia of categories? Well, we can't consider all possible functions. Why? Well, we because there's too many of them, right? There's there's so many possible functions, and there's so many possible ways of dividing up a typology, making typological statements, that it is it's just guaranteed not to succeed. So one way that we can understand the idea of making what is considered a possible typology is to ensure that they're computable. It's a pretty weak condition, right? Just say that they're computable. But what does it mean to be computable, right? Well, if we think about what computation is, al Khwarizmi said, you know, when I consider what people want in computing, it's generally a number, right? So again, several millennia later, Alan Turing had mathematized that statement to say, well, you know, there are, there are certain numbers um, that are uncomputable, meaning that it's impossible to mechanically enumerate them, okay? Um, and so that divides certain types of processes, right, the computable functions from the uncomputable functions, okay? Now, we'll also make a distinction here between computable functions and finite functions. Finite functions are of no linguistic interest. They are basically finite sets of um, inputs and outputs, okay? They are lists, and we know from the fact that language is productive, that language is generalizable, that people generalize with languages, that we don't want the types of functions that we consider to be finite, okay? So now we're, it seems we're within these two gigantic bounds between computable functions and finite functions. Okay, now what is a computable function? Well, a computable function, as given by Turing, is something that's computed by a Turing machine, okay? Um, you can also think of this as a grammar. You can think of this as an automaton. These are several different ways of saying similar things, okay? And all this is is a computational device that decides whether a string is in a set. It says yes or no, right? So it's a, from a functional perspective, it takes um, a string and maps it onto some zero or one, right? So what does this little symbol sigma here mean? Well, sigma here is just an alphabet of symbols. It's, you know, those could be IPA symbols, lexicographic symbols, anything that you want for it to you know, form your alphabet with. Sigma star is just the set of all possible strings, so it's the free monoid on sigma. And then you know, a particular function says, I'm gonna take subsets of, of this set of all possible strings and, and decide you know, whether they're you know, valid or not, okay? So an automaton performs this function, right? It takes an input and decides yes if x is valid, meaning it belongs to the set, or no if x is not valid, meaning it doesn't belong to the set, okay? Note that this is also true of um, forms of distributed computation of which neural networks are a special case, All right? Here, there's just a little bit more um, functions that we're doing on the, on, on the pre and post processing because we need a function that's gonna encode a string into some particular encoding or embedding, which we have dynamics on and which there will be um, some sort of uh, measurement on from which we'll get a yes answer, okay? All right. Now, I, I really like this quote about uncomputability, so I'm going to just say it, right? Uncomputability isn't just a mathematical concept, right? It denotes the possibility of contradiction arrived at not because of the failure of, but because of the success of reason. And this is a different sort of contradiction than when you arrive at from failure of reason, okay? So for Turing and for computability researchers, we're not just thinking mathematically. This is really a, a sort of cognitive or behavioral statement as well. Because it didn't, you know, if, if you're limited to something that's computable, you're really thinking about what does it mean to succeed yet arrive at a contradiction. So if a typology is really going to do that, right, then it's really going to be something that we don't really want to see in the in, in describing natural languages. Having computability is necessary because it allows us to even form statements that are coherent about what a possible typology can or cannot be. Okay. Now. That computability is necessary, as we've just seen, but it's not sufficient, right? And here Chomsky is going to tell us why, all right? The condition, meaning computability, has no interest. We learn nothing about a natural language from the fact that its sentences can be effectively displayed, i.e. that they constitute a recursively enumerable set, meaning they're computable. The reason for this is clear. Along with the specification of the class F of grammars, a theory of language must also indicate how, in general, relevant structural information can be obtained for a particular sentence generated by a particular grammar. So in short, the power of the computable functions, right, is 
insufficient for what we want to do because if we look at this sort of landscape of functions that I had or processes the types that I had laid out earlier computability doesn't distinguish between any of them they're all effectively computable all right so computability enables typology but it in and of itself doesn't you know it's not sufficient to totally describe why a certain process is attested or unattested it also doesn't help to decide the difference between say total reduplication and partial reduplication it doesn't help us in deciding the difference between an attested process like total re reduplication versus uh, exponential copying right and so this is un um, sustainable. So we really need to delve into types of computability. So that's going to be the subject of the next section.